Now you'll realise as well, we, we missed a little bit of Philippians last week because we had our celebration service. So I need to do a little bit of big picture stuff. That tends to be the thing. If you just jump into a little bit of uh, Bible Christianity in just one place, it's almost like, well, it's like watching a film and you just catch one minute. You're not going to get the big picture. And it's actually the big picture that shapes your understanding and tells you where new life is found. So, well, where do I start? Despite the fact that we wish we were independent thinkers, original trendsetters, our own person, the fact of the matter is, we're not. We're just not. I don't mean to insult you or anything, but the fact is, we love to follow examples. We are sheep, and we copy other people and other stuff. And isn't that the reason, if you're a parent, that you're really scared about your kids watching telly on the run-up to Christmas? Because what happens in between all of the TV programs and halfway through the TV programs and seemingly every 10 minutes, are we all right? Oh yeah. So that seemingly every 10 minutes is you get adverts. And what they do is they pick the best looking little kids. And what they do is they put them in a room with bright lights and shiny coloured walls. And they put some sort of ray gun there. And the ray gun's on show in this setting. And all the kids who are trendy and all got their sort of brand new clothes from next and really look the part and respectable and happy and well behaved are shooting each other. And all your little kids are going, yeah, if I get the ray gun, I'm going to have life, baby. And so what they do is they come up to you and they drag and yank and pull it. Mommy, if you love me, you will give me that. Because that is what I must copy. That is the example. That is where life is found. You see, we all copy and we all follow other examples, don't we? The question is, is it a good one we're following? It's the, I'm at the point now where I've been a parent long enough that the smugness of my own ability to be a good parent is beginning to wear wear off because my kids are at the age where they are revisiting on me all the mistakes that I've made. So they get stressed about the kinds of things that I get stressed about. And when they do, they don't just get stressed about the same kind of things I get stressed about. They get stressed in the same way that I get stressed about it. And it's an ugly thing to behold. It's like looking in the mirror. They get angry, and in the same way that I get angry, and all that time, it's like, I'm teaching, I'm making such wonderful children. I'm creating little monsters. Why? Because they're following my example. I love you, darling. I love you. And it's why, well, I've got this next bit of fun to come, haven't I? I've got this next bit of fun, because now my oldest is moving to the point where I want to be independent. Oh, Yes. I know what's best for me. Now, I just need to check the qualification that you understand the language here. Independence for a teenager or approaching a teenager doesn't mean I set my own route and follow my own path. It just means that I transfer who I copy from my parents to my mates. And is that a parent's worst nightmare? Oh, yes. Are we all right? Yeah? Lovely? See, what happens is we... We all follow examples, so all your eyes go, where James? It's just one of those, isn't it? Yeah, okay. So, a teenager being defiant and independent, actually, no, they're just being just as much of a sheep as before. They're just swapping who they copy. The fact of the matter is, is we're all out there looking for examples. The question is not, will I copy? But the question is, what do I copy? Whose example am I following? Which piper playing the tune am I going to dance along to? What person's example, motives, message, values are going to be shaping me? Not will I copy, but who? So at this point I could stop and say, hold on, what are you copying? Who's shaping your values? Who sets what you live for? Who is setting a compass in your direction? Now, for those of you who haven't been with us for a while, we've been working through this book of Philippians. It was a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He was, if you like, the great missionary who took the news about all that Jesus had done uh, and all of who he was. He took it out to the then known world, and as he went, he would would, um, tell people about Jesus. They'd respond, and the church would be formed. We call it church planting. And then he'd move on to the next place and leave them to talk, carry on talking about Jesus, living for Jesus. And he'd move on to the next place, the next place, the next place. And this letter is ten years after he went to a city called Philippi. Paul is now about 800 miles away in prison for Rome. In prison, not because he's done anything other than he normally does, which is tell people about Jesus. And when you tell people about Jesus, sometimes people want to get rid of you, sometimes people close the door on you, and sometimes people put you in jail. In this situation, Paul is writing back to this church in Philippi about how to stand firm 
with the values attached to the reality of Jesus Christ, God's Son, stepping into this world, not just to say, hi there, here I am, but he certainly did that, but with the intention of bringing a salvation into this world, a salvation, a rescue, a redemption, from our own self-centred, small-minded, following examples merely of people around us, what the Bible calls sin, and a salvation to being put right with God because he has paid the price for us to be put right with God. Paul writes to them and says, look, watch out for the examples around you, decide who you're standing for and how you're going to stand, and if you do stand with Jesus, it will have certain characteristics. It means, and we've been learning this all through chapter 2, you will move from living for me, self-service, asking others to give their life for you, get on board with your plan, to being an other servant and serving God. What do I mean? Well, let me try and put it into... The the Bible's ruthless in its just plain... or just plain spokenness and it doesn't doesn't mind the fact that it offends some people. So broadly speaking, the two Bible categories say there's actually really, when you boil them down, only two models or two examples of real attitudes that you can have. Attitude number one is, I am the centre of the universe. Everything is for me. I am the point, and I only like stuff that helps me be the point and be the centre of the universe. People are resources to be exploited, to help me with my vision and my happiness, or that of my immediate family, because that's me anyway, isn't it? If there is a God, he's there to dance to my tune and give me maximum comfort and make everything go according to my plan. You know, when Christmas comes around, Christmas is not about God, Christmas is about me and what I want. Now, we can have that whole attitude, and sometimes we do it politely, and sometimes we do it more aggressively. But fundamentally, the Bible tells us we're either me at the centre, or else we're the alternative. And I'll come to the alternative at the minute. Uh, have you noticed how trolley rage is on the, on the increase at the moment? You see, you can only get really cross with somebody moving their trolley in your way if you're the point. If you're the point of the world and they get in your way, then you should be angry. But if you're not the point and they just come in your way a little bit, then they're just clumsy with a trolley. Trolley. I'm all for, you know, when you're driving on the motorway, I really get annoyed. With the fa- I'm all for the fact that you should move into the left lane if there's three lanes, don't block the traffic, don't sit in the middle lane. In fact, they put the signs on the can, don't sit there, yeah? But if I'm the point of the universe and I drive down the motorway and there's somebody sitting in that lane, sitting in that lane, sitting in that lane, I'm not like, phew, I need to read the sign. I'm like, who do you think you are? It's about me, don't you know? <laughs> flash, 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 pong, 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 bashing onto the bumper. Because if I'm the point, yeah? If you're somebody here who's easily offended, can I tell you, can I just bring you a news flash? I say this lovingly and I say this from the safety, having a bit of wood or what's left of it, in, in front of me to keep me safe here, okay? If you're somebody who is easily offended, it's probably because you think you're the point and somebody has hinted that you might not be. And so your gas mark tends straight off. So, example number one is, we're the point. The universe is about us. Example number two, well, we've been learning about this in Philippians chapter 2. And in fact, Paul brings this to us here and it's wonderful the way he does this. If If you just flick back to the very bottom sentence of the previous page and you start you see the little number four there that's at the very bottom sentence there it says each of you this is a new mindset that comes from people who have met with Jesus and we'll find out why in just a moment each of you should look not only to your own interests but also to the interests of others your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus what was his attitude? me? 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 no who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Now we did a whole message on that, those few sentences, just a few weeks back. It's on the internet. Download it if you want to. But, uh, and have a listen. I'll just bring it short. What he's saying is, 
the one who actually was God, the one who is the point of the whole world, came and lived the life that we should have uh, lived and died the death that we should have died. Why? is an act of service to liberate the likes of you and me from the mess that we have happily charged ourselves into and marched happily into. You see that? So it says there in that verse, who being in very nature God, he actually was the point, but it says that he did not um, consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, that means exploited or used. Whenever any of us have resources of our own, a status, a standing, education, brightness, good looks, money, what's our first instinct? To exploit that, to use it, to grasp after it, to get ahead for us. But what did Jesus do? He used it all to serve other people, even to the point, it says there, of giving his own life for people who quite happily would have shaken his fist, shaken their fist at him from now through to eternity. So if you like, it was like we lived, option one is we live, who not being in nature God, consider themselves equal with God. That's you and me and trolley rage and being easily offended. Or Jesus comes and he serves and loves and rescues and draws you to himself and sets you with a new centre in your life and you start to become a little bit like him. So we serve like him. We make much of what he has done for us. Option one, you're the point. Option two, he is the point. Which of those two options is most common in our world today? In 21st century speak. He's not given a look at can you imagine? It might have been difficult for those people in Philippi, which was the most common model in Philippi nearly 2,000 years ago. It wasn't stand for Jesus. It should have been. It was live life yourself, get by. So Paul's writing to them here and he's saying, listen, you're going to need examples of the Lord Jesus. People who he is working. You're going to have to put around you people who will have that same mindset, who will have that same attitude of living with God as the point and serving like he has served us. And so a Christian is not somebody who sits in a pew or attends a church service or has a Bible on their lap, though they may have those. A Christian is somebody who simply has changed what they serve. They have stopped living for self and using others and they are living, loving God, serving him and serving others. Do you see that? Instead of being downward and inwards, it's upward and outwards. Because of a change from meeting with God. So, and I tell you this all the time, but you need to get this straight, don't you? That being a believer is not somebody who merely agrees with the, what the Bible says about life, God and everything. Good, you, it's right, you've got to believe those things. And it's not just somebody who's got a changed behaviour. And it's about what you do and what you don't do. Well, that's certainly part of it. But being a believer is about taking those truths and experiencing them per- personally, inwardly, so that they change you. So you move from serving yourself, your own agenda and using other people to serving God and serving others. This is the big picture. So why is this important? Paul wants wants to be very clear. You don't serve God to get in with God, to get favour. It's not like, right, I helped out at church, I stacked the chairs out, I cooked a meal at Welcome Club, put it with those teenagers at the Wednesday Club, uh, I came and painted a wall, look, Lord, here you go, here's my CV, you have to accept me now. It's not that. It's because he has first served us in coming and humbling himself and giving his life so that we may live, we get a new motivation. No, I serve and can only genuinely serve because I have been greatly served. I was speaking to this fellow earlier this week and he didn't get it. He was um, a part-time motivational speaker. And so I'll tell you what, that fellow had got the gift of the gap. He could talk. I want to have my own business. I don't want to be employed by anybody else. That's the way to success. And as I listened, I was like, so hold on, how do you motivate people? I, I mean, I didn't ask him this hour, maybe I should have done. But it, it was oozing out of him what the answers were. And the answer was, it was carrot and stick. I don't want to be a bum and be like all those other people who rely on other people to get their finance. I'm going to go out and I don't, don't want to be like everybody else. That was like the stick. 
fear of being... I want to get the rewards, I want to get the big bucks, I want to be master of my own destiny. That was the carrots. And he couldn't see any other way by which we would be motivated to serve or do anything or even get up off our backside and go out the front door. Fear of what of consequences or promise of reward. If you're a Christian, Christ has taken your punishment. There is no more that stands between you and God. He has dealt with it, paid for it on the nail. You cannot lose it. He has given it you. There's nothing else to gain. He's given you the keys to heaven. He said, you are mine from now until eternity, which is forever. Nobody can snatch that from you. So there's no stick. There's no carrot. Why on earth would I serve? And that's where the dynamic of grace comes in, doesn't it? Suddenly, when you stand there and with awe and from deep in your heart, you go, whoa, he died for me? You can't stay stuck on your chair, can you? You want to make much of him from the heart. You want to serve him and the people that he gave himself for to. You get that? So I'm serving because I've been rescued from the penalty and power of myself. My service will change and my horizons will get bigger because I want to serve, I want to make much of him, I want to make much of others. And you're saying, hold on, Steve, you're not even getting to the text here yet. And I know I'm trying to get this big picture, okay? You've got to get the big picture. I need to park here for just one more minute, okay? Because there's plenty of times where I'm I'm even worried as I do this that sometimes, you know, I've said the word serving is the right example to follow. And some of you, you're worn out from it, aren't you? You're serving the man who, who demands that you pay the bills. You're serving the demands of the kids to get because they want you to get the ray gun. You're serving the demands of whoever you live with because they want you to do this, 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 and this. And he's like, oh. When you, when you hear serving, you hear demand, demand, crush, can't handle it, I can't be one of those people, I can't be one of them fellas who charges on and family always follows, I can't be one of them yummy mummies who seems to be able to do everything right and I don't know how she manages, I, can't, I haven't got the strength to do that. Track back a little bit. Because when the Bible says serve, it means be free. Live free. You say, hold on, Steve, how does that work? Okay. Right. Stick with me. If he is the point of everything, and if he has wound up the world in such a way that everybody would just say, God, you're awesome. Everything that he asks you to do should lead you to be saying, wow, you really are awesome. Every one of the commands of the Bible is one where you experience new depths of how great and wonderful he is. So his goal isn't met if we're all like, oh dear, well we better do as God says, we better serve or he'll give us cancer and send us to hell. Oh dear. Does that leave you praising him? Of course it doesn't. God is not this God in the sky who just sort of threatens you with carrot or stick in order to make you do what he wants. He says, do what I want because I've made you that way and when you live like I've made you to be, you will be free. You see, sometimes, and some of you are stuck in this mindset, and I want to see you liberated. Some of you think that God treats you like that horrible owner who gets his dog to jump on one leg. Okay? You offer the dog enough biscuits... Or you whack the dog enough times and you can get a dog to jump on one leg. But I guarantee what you won't have, you won't have the dog jumping on one leg going, isn't my master wonderful? He's a dude. You'll be having the dog, the dog jumping on one leg going, that schmuck, I want him to die. If the whole point of it is that we give God praise and we experience more of his mercy and his liberation, any command he gives, he's not kicking back in heaven going, ha look what I can make them do. His heart is delighted when you're like, yes, all along you were right. I'll be free when I serve. <laughs> Actually, you know this, don't you? Because of people you know who trusted in Jesus, who were the ones who seemed to have the biggest anchor in the storm? Who were the ones who seemed to be more, most buoyant when life comes and knocks them? Who are the people who get the most invites to go places? It's the ones who are serving. Why? Because serving brings joy and relationship and richness as God intended. 
All his commands lead us to work for our freedom, joy and happiness. And some of you struggle, some of you don't want to trust that, some of you don't want to obey, some of you are begrudging because you think you know better than God. Yeah, I know he says I should serve, but I'll serve this much and then I'll I'll keep him quiet for the next week and get him off my back and get Steve and the elders off my back. You don't want to believe his commands. You don't want to believe that when he says something, it's for our joy. So you don't want to believe that the things that he says about sex and money and generosity and life plans and vision and surely that can't work, Lord. No, I think I'll do it my own way. And then what happens? (coughs) Crash. Car pile up. Total carnage. Can you think of anybody more beautiful to behold, more joyful in trials, more stable, more human than Jesus Christ himself? And what did he do? He gave himself in service. And the problem for you and me is that we still... I'm struggling with this and I still think I know better. I live trusting my own choices, taking my own example, believing the same adverts that we all struggle not to believe. I follow my own instincts. I hold tightly to my own idea that I really can muddle on through. I sort of post a guard to anybody who suggests that perhaps I am not God's gift to myself. I hang on to my horizons and I wonder why I messed up. I heard this phrase earlier this week and it just stuck with me. I'll I'll read it to you to get it right. It says this, You have perpetually pursued your own happiness to the detriment of your own joy. Can I say that again? We have perpetually pursued our own happiness. I know how to fix this problem. I know how to make it all work. I know how to do it. To the detriment of our own joy. Why didn't I just listen to God? Why didn't I listen to Him? No, instead what I do is I blame others and blame, and blame God and blame all of that when actually I am my greatest enemy to my own joy. I fight what Jesus calls me to do. I fight what he says. is the, This is where living is really found. He says, serve. He says, use your life as I use my life. Use it to make much of me and to serve and look out for other people. And we're in this sermon series called Together for the Gospel. And that's what we will look like as a community. We will love Jesus. He will be our example because he has saved us. But we're done. And you say, hold on, Steve, aren't you supposed to be talking about the Bible? Well, I've used that first 15, 20 minutes just to get together the big picture. And now for only a few minutes, I promise you, this is not, I'm over halfway, stop panicking, nearly. I'm over halfway, we're going to look at an example that he gives us, because he says we need the example of Jesus Christ, but he puts other people and other people's examples around us to help us figure out what a life of service looks like. Yeah? So with that in mind, that's why these verses are here in the Bible. Verse 19. I hope to the Lord Jesus, sorry, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in his own welfare. Is that right? I'm glad somebody's with me. Thank you, Katie. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. You see, what this could have been, he's basically giving travel plans. But he's not actually, he's using the situation of the travel plans to show the attitude and the motivation in the heart of these people who have been changed by Jesus. Yeah, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Let's look at Epaphroditus. But I think it necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to share, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. 
welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour men like him because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give. Right, shy moment. You've got two minutes. On this side, turn to the people near you and I want you to look at Timothy. What does service look like? What is Paul holding up as service from Timothy? Okay, which is verses 19 through to 24. Okay, the first paragraph. So turn to somebody near to you. If you see somebody who's not quite as confident, go and sit near them and encourage them and help them. This side, look at Epaphroditus, okay, verses 25 through to 30. Turn to somebody near you, move seats if you have to. Don't be so British, all right? Pretend we're sort of, I don't know, not British. Uh, Yeah, get there. And two minutes, from those two characters on either side, this is the question. What does serving look like? What attitudes does serving have? What does serving look like under the horizon of Jesus Christ as King? Brilliant, you've got one minute, two minutes, one and a half minutes. Go. I'm going to give you half a minute more, half a minute more. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for having a look at that. Um, this side first, let's shout out three or four things that attitudes of service, what service looks like from Timothy. Why Paul's put this example of Timothy in there. Shout them out for us, will you? Takes a keen interest. Brilliant. Good. What else? Proven, okay, so he's not a flash in the pan. He's stuck at it, even when it was difficult. Brilliant. Brilliant, okay. So he was, lear- he was willing to learn from others who'd walked ahead before him. Brilliant. Good. What else? Genuine. Oh, not a phony. He got a genuine concern, okay, which tells us there can probably be a feigned concern. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, let's go over to Epaphroditus. Let's have a look. What did we find in Epaphroditus? That's it. In fact, he he scarpered off on a 700 mile trip over to see Paul. Who knows whether he had wife and kids, what that would have meant. Just to travel and be known with Paul meant that you were putting your own head on the chopping block because if Paul's in prison for speaking about Jesus, are you with Paul, are you? Get in there, laddie. Okay. So he put himself at risk. Good. For the 
go, yeah, I'll come to that in just a minute. Yeah, good, what else? Yeah, I mean, this is, I was so exposed by this, because if I, let's say, you lot send me to lead a beach mission team or something like that, and when I'm there, I get man flu. Okay. Um, now, by the way, this, his illness was not man flu, gentlemen, it was proper on the, we don't know what it was, nearly killed him, okay? So here I am, I'm, I'm on a beach mission, and I'm like, I'm lying there in me sort of, I don't know, in me sleeping bag, whoa, it's me, I need to let the church know just how much I'm suffering. Oh! But not Epaphroditus, what's he doing? He's like, I might be worried. I best get out of my bed and travel the 700 miles back just to let them know I'm a okay. That, that's just what he's thinking. He, he's other centered. Brilliant, what else? He kept on going, yeah, how is he described? There's four things that describe him there. How is he described in verse, uh, um, verse 25? Brother, fellow worker, soldier, and, yeah, sorry, it doesn't come out in this version, but yeah, um, it comes up where he says, whom you send to take care of my, my needs, minister, yeah, servants, and who serves, yeah, okay. Right, so we get an idea. Now, I need to try and summarise all of that. Now, I'll try to put it into two, ca- two, um, uh, two little subheadings for you before we finish so that you get the idea. What is it that these guys have in common from, being met, from meeting with Jesus? They've seen what Jesus has done for them, and it has entered their heart, and now their horizon has been changed. They're looking at life differently. Two ways. Number one, a genuine concern for others. Number two, living for the cause of God. Okay, number one, a genuine concern for others. Number two, living for the cause of God. Firstly, um, a concern for others. Well, you've mentioned it there. You can see it in Timothy. For I have, so verse 20, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Verse 26 and 27, Epaphroditus, we said, didn't we? He was really concerned, not so much about the fact he was dying of malaria or whatever it was, and got pus spurt, pus spurting out of him, but he was just really worried about how it would impact the church back home. Now, this contrasts the way that sometimes we serve. Because my guess is that plenty of times, uh, that plenty of you who are regular here will have got stuck in or have turned up at things or have committed to do stuff regularly. But you see, in the Bible, why we do something is more important sometimes than what we do. And you know this, don't you? You know that sometimes you can do the right thing for the wrong reason and it becomes sin. So it's possible, and we spot these, I'm going to bring this one out quickly because I think we're good at spotting these and speak. It's possible to be somebody who says they're serving the Lord when actually what they're doing is they're serving to promote themselves. Yeah? So they'll turn up, they'll be very reliable, but the times when they get disappointed is when there's nobody there to see them do it. Or if somebody comes along and they've been doing it for a long time and they do it better than them, and immediately they're threatened. And it's when those kind of occasions happen that the reason, the motivation for the service of people or others, there may be a genuine concern for a group or a particular individual, it emerges out. And you see that actually it was motivated not so much by love for God, concern for people, but actually a way to get an angle on people. And it's when it goes wrong that that it's it's shown. It's also sometimes we'll, we'll quite often serve in order to just feel superior to people. Oh, you know what I was doing the other night? I was feeding the hot homeless down on, on London Road. Oh, yes. They were so glad I was there. And it just feeds a sense of superiority. I am better. But it's clear that when you serve with those motives, it's, you, you may be serving it, you might be doing it, but it's not because you've met with Jesus. You may have met with Jesus, but you're not bringing the, your meeting with Jesus to bear in the situation, because in the situation, he says, why do you need to try to get approval from people? I'm the darling of heaven, and I've done everything that, me, that is necessary for me to give you a stamp of my approval. I've said and made you all right with me. Why do you need to live before the eyes of other people to feel good about yourself? No, self-esteem won't be found in you doing lots of good things and everybody giving you a thumbs up. Your confidence will be that I loved you and valued you enough to die for you. Your worth is measured not by your service, but by my service of you. My blood spilled for you. Pride, proud, feeling better than other people. 
why you haven't applied the gospel, have you? Because if you think you're better than other people, why on earth did I have to die for you? You were so lost in your sins and transgressions and cut off from God that any amount of good deeds would actually never have got you anywhere near. You were such a mess that you needed me to come in, deal with your junk and get you right with me yourself. So don't you dare get proud. You are the spiritual equivalent of people on London Road. The only problem for you is you haven't spotted it yet. So you're probably in a worse state. And suddenly when you let the gospel of the Lord Jesus in, it says, no, you don't serve with that. If you're going to serve, you're going to serve because you've met with God, you've loved him, and he's changed your heart, and you want to make much of him and show a genuine concern for other people. And I just hold my head in my hands because I can't tell you the number of times I've gone home on a Sunday and I've viewed the way that Sunday has gone on the basis of how many people have turned up and how many people have said, oh, that was helpful to And you're the same when you cook a meal for somebody, when you buy the kids a present at Christmas. You know, maybe there's, there's, there's motives in there which are genuinely good and towards other people, but then suddenly you get a snapshot of yourself and you're like, whoa, there's a lot of me in here too. And as you let the Lord Jesus in, more and more you will serve with an increasingly genuine concern. You don't need to be protecting your own interests. He's done that. I'm now free to give myself away in genuine concern. And wasn't that what Timothy and Epaphroditus did? That's the remedy. Quickly here. If that's concern for others in the way that you serve, there's also you'll be living the cause of God. I love this here. Verse 21 and verse 25. Here we are. Verse 21. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And that's what was modelled to us, isn't it? We were talking about that earlier. Live for you, you are the point. Verse 25, you see it here as well. But I think it is necessary to set... Oh, hold on, not verse 25. Uh, I can't remember why I was quoting verse 25, so I won't say anything about it. Okay. Looking out for the interests, the cause of Jesus Christ. And immediately that tells us that church isn't about sitting in a pew. It's not about going to a meeting. If you become a Christian, you don't go to a meeting, you join a cause. You join the cause of Jesus Christ, his agenda for this world. That's why we say don't come to church, we say be a part of the church family. Because that's what you are. You're you're part of a cause that is moving forward, pushing on, serving the Lord God of heaven and earth. And I was thinking about this compared with the poor. You know uh, what's been going on around St. Paul's Cathedral recently? You seen it in the news? There's all the protesters, the anti-capitalist protesters, just outside of St. Paul's, and St. Paul's Cathedral closed the door. And you can see that you've got those two mentalities going on. You've got a church, which basically is about having the doors open and closed, and you go in and you go out. And then you've got a cause next to them, haven't you? You've got all those tents, and those people turn up for a cause, and they... Well, that's the problem. I don't know what they do. All we know is they're anti-capitalists. And I've listened to some of their interviews on the news. And I'm like, tell me what you're for. What are you going for? All I know is what you're not for. And here we are. And I think that's a great warning to us, isn't it? It can be that we... Yeah, we're here for the kingdom of God. And we should be living in such a way that we are for Jesus. And that is shown by the way we serve other people and make much of the Lord. In everyday bits of life, in the way we choose to use our time. So that the message can never be muddled up. When you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't just sit on a pew. You join a cause and it's to make much of him and serve others as he has served us. And so in that case, our service won't be forced, will it? Oh, it won't be forced. It's possible, and some of you have done it, it is possible to serve out of being forced. So poor Nathan's not here today because he's up at the call centre taking calls for Santander. And you've done this, so don't say you haven't, but you rang up a call centre on the bounce. And when you're on the bounce, you lay into that poor fellow who's about six or seven levels below the person who set the policy who you're really angry with. But you don't care. You're going to give some poor beggar both barrels. And if it's Nathan, then so be it. He's getting paid £1.20 an hour or whatever it is to do it. He deserves it. He's going to get both barrels. And what's Nathan doing on the other end of the phone? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry I've ruined your kid's birthday party. I'm so sorry you couldn't get your flat screen TV to work. Oh, I'm so sorry that you've overspent your limit and now you're getting charged. I'm so s- Let me see what I can do to help. Is he serving out compassion? Is his heart welling over with love and, uh, uh, and empathy for the person who's struggling in this terrible situation? Well, the answer will be seen the second that he presses the disconnect button. Because the second he 
presses the disconnect button. You see, he was being forced to serve. Was he serving out of a heart of compassion? Now, I picked on Nathan. I'm sure Nathan never does that. He did tell me one time, though, he was, he was told in no uncertain terms, the fellow on the other end of the phone says, I don't want to talk to the monkey, give me the organ grinder. I was like, oh, bless it. Bless it. You see, you can be fine. Is the Lord honours when you begrudgingly grit your teeth and give them and says, be generous with my money? Have it. No! Because we've met with him, because we made much of him, because he has saved us and given us a new destiny, because he has had genuine concern for us, because he calls, calls us to be part of his cause now, Epaphrodite just got off his butt and travelled for the good of the gospel to encourage and support Paul. He was also worried for his church family because he was saying, this is where life is at. And Paul holds them up and he simply says, do like that yourselves and follow people who do the same. Now this is incredibly liberating. I've got to finish with this because this is so important. This is liberating because you notice what isn't said here about service. Be strong. Have gifting. Have ability. Because some of you will be sitting there going, I can't possibly serve God. I can't even count. I don't know what, what hope have I got. But notice all of these things that you've been called to, they're not abilities, skills, talents. They're an attitude of heart towards God and to other people. Is there anybody in here who's met with Christ who cannot grow in their love and their affection and put people first? Which of us can't just get down on our knees even, after, even, to the, even before we leave and say, what would you have me do? And don't expect it to be a big thing like go overseas. Maybe it will be. But it will be pick up the phone. It will be put myself out. It will be use my money for something different to what I was going to use it for. It will be speak to somebody who I was really nervous about. Lord, what can I do? Put around you examples of people like this, says the Apostle Paul. We're really good. Huh? I mean, that means a grace us, but we're really good that if there's anybody who's um, moving on and uh, maybe a little bit further on in the Christian faith with us, we're, we're, we're very quick to try and knock them down to size. No, speak about them with high honour and say, do you know what, I want to be around that person. They've grown. How is it they've grown? Maybe they can help me grow. That's why we have trainees here, don't we? I mean, it talks about a, a father with a son. It's the idea of apprenticeship there. We have trainees to equip people to live for Christ, whether they stay here or whether they go elsewhere. And we've been blessed with great Timothys with our trainees. We want each of us to be a training, learning and growing from one another. You will follow an example. The only question is, which one? And Paul says, go for these here. So some of you, last three sentences, some of you I need to say this to. Don't you dare try and serve God. Don't, please don't go away from here hearing the message that Steve's saying, you've got to serve God unless he has first served you. You need to go to him first and let him serve you in his mercy and his grace through what Jesus has done. Don't even think about trying to rack up a load of I've done this, God, until you've first been humbled and let him say, I will forgive you and cleanse you of your sin and I will bring you into my cause and you will experience my concern. Then you start to serve him. Perhaps if you are one of those people who've done that already, you realise as you've listened today that you've served with a lot of wrong motives. Perhaps you've felt like you've been forced. Perhaps you've seen God as an ogre. Perhaps you've felt like you've been serving in order to get an angle on people or get a name for yourself or get some power. Then what you need to do is just very quietly say, Lord, I confess. I confess that sometimes when I've been supposed to be making much of you, I've been making much of myself. Have mercy on me, Lord. Please. Remind me of that gentle concern and that wonderful cause that actually does fire my heart. Please, cleanse, clean out my service. And some of you, you just simply need to ask and say, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me do? How can I step out in some small way, whether it's next door, across the street, round the corner, in my office, with a family member, whether it's at the Noah's, in the church, with Wednesday Club, Welcome Club, whether it's going along to Fellowship Group and making sure you're the most reliable, maybe it's giving people lifts to do, whatever it is, it's doing, Lord, what would you have me do to make much of you and serve like I have been served? Paul says, pack around yourself people who are like that who will help you. So what we're going to do is just take a moment now to pray. 
I thought I'd got loads of time, just clicked on, the, st the clock stopped. That's why I've always had five minutes left in my mind. <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> I blame Mark for that. Did it? I didn't know it was that one. I was like, wow, I've got loads of time left. Let's go for it, baby. Do you want the next round? Because it still says 5 to 11. <laughs> no, look, let's pray before we sing. Let's take a moment of quiet. First of all, thank the Lord for the way he's served you. Just thank him for what he's done. Though he is God and always will be and always has been, yet he didn't exploit that to his own gain. He gave himself in the person of his son for you. And he served. Thank him for that. Come before him and confess the fact that so often you followed wrong models and wanted to believe the news about yourself, that you're the point. And in his world, that is a heinous sin. Confess that and thank, you. thank him that there, is, that there is mercy and there is grace for people like us. Perhaps you just need to say, Lord, please help me to use this time as an opportunity to say, what would I do? What would you have me do? How do you want me to grow? Perhaps you need to confess that you haven't been a very good example to other people and you just want the Lord to help you be an example of living for Christ. Perhaps you want to pray with me that we would be a church who are known for our cause, not of putting up tents and being anti this and anti that, but for being for Christ, making much of him, serving as he has served us, loving people, even if they don't appreciate it or aren't that bothered. Lord, please help us to be together for the gospel. We thank you for these wonderful words of life, the freeing truth that you have done everything, that you have served us, and all eternity will be filled with us discovering new ways in which you've been gracious beyond what we've deserved. Forgive us, Lord, that we've served ourselves so much. Forgive us, Lord, that we follow the wrong models. Please, Lord, help us. Help us to stand together encouraging one another to make much of you and to love Christ with all of our hearts. We thank you for the example of Timothy and Epaphroditus and the impact they had in their day and their generation. And we ask, Lord, that in the steady, proved dealings of day-by-day -day living, we in some way would leave a legacy of serving quietly because we love you. Help us in this, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to stand and sing in just a moment. We're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision. Um, and then we're going to sing another one straight after. Be that my vision is saying, Lord, would you be the one who shapes who I am and how I serve and what I live for? And then the next one is just one about the Lord Jesus and about how he's worthy of being praised every day. So when the introduction's played, we'll stand to sing.